<laughs> so I'm Cody. And I'm Kurt. Oh. Okay, well, can I skip this question? But um, with the mind and body, there's been a debate between the mind and body stuff. Is it in Descartes? Says there was a dualism of the mind and body. He says that the body is governed by mechanical and natural laws, and that the mind is different than this, and that according to him, it's not governed by mechanical principles, it's unextended, free, and lacking in substance. So it's like basically an empty, it's like a giant, vast space of thought and thinking. Um, John Locke said that the mind at birth is a blank slate, which tabula, tabula rasa means blank slate, and it's a concept that the that at birth infant's mind is a blank slate. The teachings of the, ta, the theory of tabula rasa, it said that it goes all the way back to Aristotle, and he had another, um, he had a, another phrase, it's like, um, I can't remember what it was, I had it wrote down, but I don't remember where I had it up. Now, John Locke said the mind is a blank slate, and it's developed to experience. So, and then I kind of question, well, is the mind, is it developed through nature or nurture? And it's really both. Although the mind is mostly a blank slate at birth, and it's developed through experience, heredity also plays an important role. It's like, I kind of seen it similar to personality. You're going to have a personality similar to your parents, but through your experiences, you're still going to have a different personality than they do. Also, the mind is also, like I said, it's influenced in heredity. In the study of twins, they've shown that even though they are identical, they may also act differently. And this is a quote I got online. Despite having the same genetic makeup, identical twins have their own distinctive personalities. Just how their individuality emerges has remained a bit of a mystery, but now research has found that life experiences affect brain development, and this may help us understand how personalities form. A good way I thought about it, I don't, I, I read this somewhere. It was just like some kind of little blog form thing. It said uh, development and personality and everything. It's like a painting. You can have two identical pieces of paper, but the paint will usually come out completely different depending on what it's painted with, where it's painted, and who paints it. So, and this takes me to the next question of intelligence. The, okay, what is intelligence? Google defines this as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, which I like this definition because it actually, it really brings out the cognitive, the cognitive side of, it, of what intelligence is. And some of the skills I was, that I can think of was like interpersonal, intrapersonal, social skills, cognitive ability, academic skills and linguistic skills. That's just a few I could find online. So is intelligence developed through bio, bio, biological means or is it through experience? The nativ nativist approach would say that these skills are, you're born with them and that they're already naturally inside you. And for some of these, it's their studies that show this is actually true. One of these would be linguistics. The reason this is like infants, they learn, how, they learn how to speak a lot faster than they learn how to read. They said that reading is about 10 times harder than it is to, it's 10 times harder to learn than it is to learn how to talk. It's like learning a second, it's like basically, I mean, you can't watch somebody read and then learn how to read. You have to teach yourself. But in speaking, you can just listen, a baby can listen to somebody speaking, they can pick up on words and start to form their own language. <coughs> Modern psychologists see the nature nurture debate today as representing an outdated source of no, uh, outdated state of knowledge. Both nature and nurture are both interwoven in the develop, development of behavior, personality, and intelligence. And the reason I added behavior and personality into this is I think with intelligence, per behavior and personality ties into that because I think intelligence, personality, and intelligence, behavior, personality, and intelligence are kind of woken together to actually bring out who you are. Um, okay, so one of the stats I found was that in early development in adoptive children, there's similarity in IQ scores to the parents, 
later on in the teen years that the similarities disappear and they start to be more like their original parents. As a, moreover, adoption studies indicate that by, child, by adulthood, adoptive siblings are no more similar in IQ than strangers, while full siblings show a correlation of 0.6. When, okay, I think half my quote got deleted, but onto that. So back to linguistics. Like I was saying, that reading is easier. There was work done with Creos, which show linguistic attributes not seen in any other parent language, any of the parent languages, and the poverty of the stimulus, which purports to show that children learn language from incomplete sources, both contribute to the idea that humans have linguistic knowledge hardwired into their brains. Like I said, you don't have reading hardwired in your brain, you have linguistics already hardwired in there. And I, I, I believe that pretty well. Um, I had in here what the poverty of the commons is. Poverty of the what? The or <clears throat> poverty of the stimulus. It, oh, In other words, the parents can't don't supply enough information. They're, right. They're not given enough information to to uh, support how much the child learned. Mm. Yeah, that I means it is already there. Yeah. Probably. Thanks. I couldn't remember what that yeah. was. Now, there's mental illnesses that actually affect intelligence and and skills. Like uh, certain mental illnesses can affect the acquisition of knowledge or interfere with certain skills. Um, the acquisition of knowledge part, I actually had a friend who had a learning disability. It, not, it didn't matter how hard or how much help he got with math or how hard he studied, he, did, he could not remember math or anything, but you, he can memorize a song instantly after listening to like one time. Um, and I decided to kind of stick with one, one mental illness. I, shows social anxiety disorder. It affects the social, interpersonal, and interpersonal skills of a person. The person, for example, may be so uncomfortable carrying on a conversation that he is unable to talk to others, particularly someone he, he does not know. A person who is anxious over being observed may be unable to go out to dinner because she fears, or he fears being watched while she is eating and drinking. I got this off the actual DSM-5 website. It goes into a lot of detail over social anxiety disorder. And social anxiety disorder has been shown to be severe enough to push people to limit leaving their houses. They only leave their house just for the essentials. The people are so scared to be put into a social interaction, they refuse to leave the house at all. It's like, it's kind of just avoiding the problem. They don't want to have to deal with the social interaction, so they just avoid it altogether. This but this can also be caused by another social mental illness called agoraphobia, which I feel is pretty similar. It's another social uh, mental disorder, which is the fear of being put in a place you cannot escape from, like a large crowd. If you're put in, like, okay, we'll put, we'll kind of use this for example. I, in the middle of a presentation, I could just walk out and go home, or I'd fail, fail class. If somebody had agoraphobia, they'd be terrified of doing this. Now, there's three types of therapy, four, that I found for social anxiety disorder. <clears throat> the first one would be cognitive therapy, and this focuses more on the thoughts of the person, the like the cognitive thoughts. And basically, it's like, I'm going to mess up my, all my presentation. Like, before I even gave my, give, before I start giving my presentation, it'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to mess up my presentation. I get nervous and I get anxious in the middle of doing it, and then I started messing up, which I messed up a few times. And one of the one of the ways to actually fix this is to challenge the negative thoughts. There was there's three steps to it. First, you need to like designate the um, designate the thoughts, your negative thoughts, and you challenge them. Like, okay, I'm going to mess up on my presentation. Well, then I start thinking, am I really going to mess up my presentation, or am I just overthinking this? Am I overreacting to being nervous? And this kind of brings the person that has social anxiety sort of back to reality. It's like, okay, well, I can do this. This isn't going to be that bad. And next is behavioral therapy. This is more of the like, concrete things that cause it. It focuses on the external situations that cause anxiety, like a large group gathering or public speaking. Some people can't do public speaking because it terrifies them. They just 
freeze up. They can't even be in front of a group or anything. One of the ways that uh, it says to do this is to actually control your breath and stay calm. I, I feel, I see, I kind of see it hard to tell somebody with some anxiety or just keep calm and do it. But there's a, it gave a whole, a whole list of ways to actually like breathing exercises that will actually help you stay calm in the middle of having like the anxiety disorder. And it says the best one to stop this is actually exposure therapy, which is facing your fears one step at a time. It's also called systematic desensitization. It's like a person who's afraid of going outside. I, I think you used an example of this, like first you take them to the window, like, hey, it looks nice outside. Next day, you take them out on the porch, just have a talk and talk them through everything. Next, you kind of wait at the end of the sidewalk, and it's like, come out here, and we'll have a talk, and then eventually they'll be, they won't be that bothered by going outside. Now, there's three parts of systematic desensitization. One of them is learning, relax, re learning relaxation skills. Like I said, the controlling your breathing. And then the next one is creating a step-by-step -step list. You, the desensitization, like I said, first you start with one thing, then you do the next. And by creating a list, you keep yourself focused on it and you stay designated on the task. And then the next one is working through these steps. And I actually got an example of, the example I chose was facing a fear of flying. First, step one, you would look at the look at photos of a plane, then you'd watch a video of planes, watch, then you'd watch real planes take off, and then book a plane ticket, and then so on and so on until you actually take the flight. This has been shown to this has been shown to actually fix, like almost cure social anxiety, oh, social anxiety disorder completely. It's kind of what I gotta do when I get nervous. And here's my references. Anybody have any questions? The uh, Creole uh, study was pretty fascinating. Do you remember? Yeah. I didn't know that because I actually looked up the language. There really is, you can't tell it's similar to any other language. There's really not any, like the parent languages, it doesn't look similar to anything really. Mm -hmm. It's a cross between like French and English or something, something like, like that. Something like French, Latin maybe, I don't know. Like, I don't well, know. What French is cross of Latin and it's more Latin based. What's that? Oh. I should yeah. actually look that more up. Any questions? I don't, don't, don't exhibit a bit that. I was wanting to look that up a little more and see what it actually, what the language was.